Hi there, this is Kevin Patton with a brief audio introduction to episode number 56 of the A&P Professor podcast, also known as TAP Radio, an audio triathlon for teachers of human anatomy and physiology. Well, this is a preview episode, so let's do some previewing. In the upcoming full episode, episode 56, well, it's going to be kind of a long one. We have a lot to cover. One of the segments is going to be on a new kind of RNA that's been discovered called glycoRNA. And then we'll have another segment on a new kind of macrophage that's been discovered called a barrier macrophage found in our joints. And we'll have a segment on how to safely label those expensive anatomy models that we use for lab practicals. And the featured segment is going to stem out of the discussion from the previous episode, that is episode 55, where we were discussing spelling, case, and grammar. And this time we're going to talk about what that has to do with desirable difficulty and retrieval practice. So that's all coming up on the full episode number 56. The free distribution of this podcast is sponsored by the Master of Science in Human Anatomy and Physiology Instruction, the Happy Degree. I'm on the faculty of this program, so I know the incredible value it is for A&P teachers. Check out this online graduate program at nycc.edu slash happy, that's H-A-P-I, or click the link in the show notes or episode page. It's time once again for Word Dissection. It's that opportunity we have to break down some of the terms that we're going to be hearing in the full episode. And not only does that give us practice in doing that because we do that all the time in our A&P course, right? But it also helps give us a deeper understanding of those terms and sort of primes the pump so that when we hear them in the full episode, We're fully prepared to hear the message. And we have quite a few of them, so I better get going here. The first is a set of two that have to do with teaching rather than science. And these two terms are formative and summative. And I've used these before in prior episodes. For example, uh, episodes one, two, and seven, these ideas came up and I used some of these terms. And so let's break them down to help us understand them better. First one is formative. So that relates to formative assessments or formative exams or quizzes or something like that. And if we break it down, the first word part form means (laughs) form. That's what it means. It means, you know, form or shape or mold. And then when we add the AT to it, which is really a shortened form of ATE, and we've seen that word part before in these word dissections. That's a verb form, so it changes something into a verb. So with those two word parts we have so far, form and ate, we could translate that formate uh, to be like to make or something like that. And then there's another part, that I-V-E ending, and so it makes it formative. Now, the I-V-E ending is an adjective suffix, so it makes the word an adjective. It means relating to. So formative means relating to the making of something, the shaping of something, the molding of something. So that's formative. And then we have summative. And we break that down, the first word part, sum, S-U-M. Of course, we're going to add another M to it as a kind of a combining consonant there. But the basic word part is S-U-M. And a sum is an aggregate, especially if you aggregate different quantities and put them together into a single quantity. Uh, in other words, you're summing something. You're, you're summing quantities. You're adding them together. And then the AT part is the same as it was in formative. It's the verb form. And so it makes it into a verb. So when you summate something, you're doing the process of aggregating things, aggregating quantities especially, into a single thing, a single quantity. Then we have the IVE ending. Once again, it's the adjective suffix, so it means relating to. So putting it all together, summative means relating to the process of putting quantities together, relating to summation, the summing of things. 
How does that relate to teaching? Well, formative assessments, what they do is they measure how a student is learning as the course progresses. In other words, it's a way to measure the formation, the shaping of the knowledge of that student as they progress through the course. Summative tests or assessments or quizzes, on the other hand, measure how much a student has learned in that course. So formative is sort of a a process of learning to kind of keep an eye on, well, how much do I know? This much? Okay, I want to know more. Or this much? Okay, that's good enough. I'm going to move on to the next thing. So that's the formative part of it. The summative part is maybe at a midterm or a final where we say, well, how much did that student learn? How much did I learn in that course? And so I'll take a summative assessment that I would take after I've done maybe several formative assessments. So that's oversimplifying the whole thing. But we're going to talk a little bit about at least the formative part in the upcoming full episode. Another term that we want to break down in our word dissection is practical. Now, that's an ordinary English word, I know, but it's used in an extraordinary way in teaching anatomy and physiology, because if I refer to the practical, what that means is a practical lab test. Usually, that's what that means. It could be a clinical thing, but we're talking about basic sciences here. So, we're talking about a test where we're going to maybe have students identify structures in a dissected specimen, or identify structures in anatomy model, or in a prepared skeleton, or skull, or uh, maybe under a microscope, we're going to have them identify tissues or parts of tissues under a microscope. So these are all called practicals, or practical lab tests, or lab practicals. And if you're not used to teaching science in general, and anatomy and physiology in particular, and you're new to this, You may hear your colleagues talking about the practical and not really understand what that is if you've never heard it used as a student. Now, you may already be used to that. I don't know. But so how did we get, (laughs) how did we get that name though? I mean, we kind of all accept that that's what we call them, but why do we call them that? What does practical mean here? So practical comes from the first word part, practic, where, where we get our word practice. And that simply means do, D O, do. The A-L ending, that's an adjective ending, so it means relating to. So a practical, anything that is practical, relates to doing something. And so that makes sense, right? Because we want to distinguish a regular written quiz or test where you're answering questions on paper or these days, you know, on a keyboard. We want to distinguish those from actually doing something in the lab. And in this case, we're not necessarily performing an operation, although practicals can have a station where you perform an operation to, you know, get to the answer, to get to the, uh, uh, to do the assessment part of it. But a lot of times it's the doing of the identification. You're sort of doing what you were doing when you were doing your original dissection or doing your original microscopic studies. And you go in and you identify based on that doing. So we ended up calling them practical tests because we want to see what you can do in practice, in real identification of structures, in real identification of tissues, for example, or cells within a tissue. So that's practical. Another term I'm going to break down is rheumatoid arthritis, or RA for short. And so the first part of rheumatoid is rheuma, R-H-E-U-M-A. And that literally means a flow or discharge, usually referring to that flow or discharge of excess mucus that we see when mucous membranes are inflamed. And that has taken on some broader meaning, uh, referring to not only the inflammatory process in general, but immune processes in general. So we can take rheuma literally to mean flow or discharge of excess mucus. But we can also take it in a broader sense to refer to something related to inflammation or to immunity. Then we have oid, that word part. We've seen that numerous times. It means like or similar to. And then arthra, A-R-T-H-R, and that means joint. 
And then itis is an ending that refers to a condition involving inflammation. So itis is inflammation. So rheumatoid means related to or like the inflammatory process or immune process. And then arthritis means joint inflammation. So it's joint inflammation that is characterized by an immune process that involves inflammation. So it's somewhat redundant, yes, but it does distinguish rheumatoid arthritis from other kinds of arthritis, which are not necessarily associated with a high degree of inflammation, such as arthritis due to an injury, or osteoarthritis, or gouty arthritis, and others that have some slightly different characteristics and are not necessarily involving the same immune functions as rheumatoid arthritis. Another term I want to break down is the type of RNA. And one of the things, the, one of the many things I love about RNA is there's all kinds of different types of RNA. And we talk a lot about some of the basic types involved in protein coding and translation and so on, such as mRNA, messenger RNA, uh, tRNA, transfer RNA, rRNA, ribosomal RNA. Yet there, we're discovering more and more other kinds of RNA. And one kind of RNA that is going to be mentioned in the upcoming full episode is a kind of RNA called YRNA. It's usually written as a capital Y, then a space, then capital R, capital N, capital A. So it's YRNA. So it's a little bit different uh, you know, use of case there in that abbreviation than we ordinarily see with RNA abbreviations. But, uh, well, that keeps it interesting, right? <laughs> So you know that the RNA part means ribonucleic acid, so I'm not going to go any further with that part. But the why part, where does that come from? My answer to that is, <laughs> why not? Why ask why? And I'm being <laughs> cagey here because why doesn't really mean anything here. It's called why RNA, and you think, okay, what does the why stand for? It's just arbitrary. They picked it to distinguish it from another kind of small non-coding RNA, and why RNA is a small non-coding RNA. But there was another one called URNA, written, you know, with the same style, capital U, space, capital R, capital N, capital A. And so here they found another one that wasn't URNA, and they needed another name, so somebody decided why. <laughs> and so... They called it that. Maybe it was a question. Maybe it was facetious or something. They said, why do we need another name? Yeah, good name. Why? Why RNA? I don't know. But that's how we got the name. So it's a short non-coding RNA. And a non-coding RNA is one that is not directly involved in transcription translation. It has some other function, often involved with the genetic code, but not involved in those uh, real direct roles like messenger RNA in terms of the coding part of it. Uh, YRNA is a short, non-coding RNA that's uh, known to be involved in DNA replication, probably has some other functions in uh, humans as well. And we know that humans have four, or at least there are four that we know of, and they're designated as 1, 3, 4, and 5. Another word that I want to break down is glycan, G-L-Y-C-A-N, glycan. Some people say glycan. So breaking that down, the G-L-Y part, or the GLYC part, gliss or glyce, means sweet. But, of course, when we apply that to biochemistry, we're usually referring to a sugar or something related to a sugar. And so that's the glyce part. And then the AN ending is an adjective ending that can also really be a noun. Um, in other words, oh, I don't know, I'm, part of my ancestry is German. So that AN ending means that it can be a characteristic like German chocolate cake, but I'm a German, and so I'm a noun, right? That's how the AN ending can be used. It's an adjective ending, but it can also refer to whatever is being referred to by that adjective. And so now it's, it's a noun. <laughs> if we put glycan, you know, we put those two things together, it literally means something or someone sweet. So, I don't know, if somebody calls me a glycan, then that, I would take that as a compliment, right? <laughs> but they're saying I'm sweet. But the, um, when we see it in biochemistry, of course, uh, we're referring to a molecule. We're referring to a compound that is sweet. 
typically an oligosaccharide. So there's a word that we need to break down. Oligo means few. Saccar, that S-A-C-C-H-A-R word part means sugar. And then the I-D-E is a chemical ending. So an oligosaccharide is a chemical that's made up of a few sugars, specifically little units called monosaccharides. Sometimes they're called single sugars. So we know that mono means one. So monosaccharide has a single saccharide group, and an oligosaccharide would be made up of several of those monosaccharides, all bound together into one molecule. Some oligosaccharides are called glycans. And one category of glycan, and one that we'll, we will mention in the upcoming episode, is called N-glycan. So it's capital N-glycan. Glycan all in small case. So an N-glycan is what we call that category of glycans when the glycan is attached to a molecule, to another molecule, by way of that molecule's nitrogen atom. So when it binds to a nitrogen atom, and that's the method of attachment, then that glycan that is now attached is called an N-glycan. You may also sometimes see O-glycans referred to. So it's capital O-glycan. And that's where the glycan is attached to another molecule by way of its oxygen atom. A related term that we'll mention now, because it is going to come up in the, the full episode, that is glycosylation. We just take that glyco part from glycan and add the ation ending, which we know is a process. And so glycosylation is when you add glycans to lipids or proteins. And we know a lot about that process. That isn't anything new, but we're always learning new things. And I'm going to mention one of those new things in the the full episode. And when you glycosylate a molecule, a, a lipid or a protein, it of course is going to change the structure and therefore change the function of that molecule that it's attaching to. So glycosylation is an important functional process because it's a way that our body has to regulate, that is, affect the function of various other molecules in the cell of the human body, cells of the human body. An example would be you can, if you glycosylate a lipid molecule and turn it into a glycolipid, that molecule then can then act as a signal recognized by the immune system, like the, the little markers that are on red blood cells that identify blood types. Or it can also have the, be a glycolipid that is involved in the junctions between cells. Those are two sets of very important kinds of functions that we see operating in the human body and that we talk about in our AMP course. Now, of course, the glycosylation process is something that is going a little bit deeper than most of us go into in our AMP class. But of course, this podcast is about helping us understand some of the the background stories that we're not necessarily telling in our own class, but are helping to give us as instructors a little bit deeper understanding of the basic stories that we are telling our students. So all of these terms are going to show up in one way or another in the upcoming full episode, episode 56. So stay tuned. It'll be available soon. This podcast is sponsored by HAPS, the Human Anatomy and Physiology Society, promoting excellence in the teaching of human anatomy and physiology for over 30 years. Go visit HAPS at theapprofessor.org slash HAPS. That's H-A-P-S. Each preview episode usually has a book club recommendation, and this is no exception. I have another Recommendation from the AMP Professor Book Club. This time it's a book called The Miniature Guide to Critical Thinking Concepts and Tools. It's part of the Thinker's Guide Library. And this is the new 8th edition written by Richard Paul and Linda Elder. Now, these two authors have been central figures in the understanding of critical thinking and how to teach it to students. In fact, they're credited with getting the whole critical thinking movement off the ground and into our heads. This is a brand new edition of a tiny little book, hence the word miniature in the title. 
that I think every AMP teacher needs to keep handy. Like a little devotional that you pick up regularly and meditate on a different page. Now, like a devotional that you might use for mindfulness or religious practice, this little book has all kinds of truths and mysteries revealed in a simple, easy-to-grasp way. Different ways of looking at how we and our students think and learn. Things that help shape how we look at our theory and practice of teaching. Things we already know that we need to be reminded of and things we need to meditate on a bit to appreciate more deeply. And some things we don't know or have never seen presented in quite that way. And I'm serious. I'm challenging you to get this book and make it a practice to start every week with 10 minutes of reading and thinking about just one page out of this book. When you do, let me know what insights and inspirations come to you. A searchable transcript and a captioned audiogram of this preview episode are funded by AAA, the American Association for Anatomy, at anatomy.org. This is Kevin Patton signing off for now and reminding you to keep your questions and comments coming. Why not call the podcast hotline right now at 1 833 Lion Den? That's 1 833 546 6336. Or visit us at theapprofessor.org. I'll see you down the road. Paid sponsorships and affiliate links help defray podcast expenses. I sometimes receive compensation for teaching courses, consulting, speaking, training wild animals, writing educational content, and other activities mentioned in this podcast.